Okay, I believe we are rolling. Uh, we lost a few people. Uh, Lucy is having laptop problems. I'm hoping she will join us. So I thought we'd get going. Uh, our uh, and folks, uh, hear me. Give me some sign on the on the in the chat uh, on the chat panel there. Is anyone hearing me? I see uh, five people. Looks like five viewers. Okay, loud and clear. Seems great. All right, so let's get going. I'm sure Lucy will uh, get uh, get back on whenever she can. She was having computer trouble, uh, so I will. Uh, we've been doing this as more or less a dialogue, but uh, I'll go I'll go solo this time. So thanks for uh, thanks for joining us. I hope a few more people straggle in. I think I think we lost some people because of the uh, the delay start. Uh, the topic is, uh, as you all know, is uh, drawn from an article I wrote. Back in January, or at least was posted in uh, on Liberty.me in January, uh, called "What Are Libertarians Out to Accomplish?" And I explained in the beginning of this article that um, when I was researching an earlier article about Nathaniel Brandon, who, who died at the end of last year, uh, I was researching an article about, you know, what he had to say about libertarianism and and about his career and just uh, uh, my uh, brief contact with him. I uh, came across an, uh, an, an audio uh, tape or audio, online audio file of, uh, of, a, of a speech he gave in 1979 to the National uh, Libertarian Party Convention. That was the convention that nominated Ed Clark, which uh, got, at least up to that time, the highest number of votes of the presidential candidate uh, had gotten. Uh, since the founding of the party in 72 or 71 or 72. Uh, and uh, Brandon gave a speech, which was called, What Happens When the Libertarian Movement Begins to Succeed? And, uh, and which I listened to at that time. I don't remember actually being at the speech, but I listened to it while I was doing this research. And I found it extremely interesting, so interesting that I thought libertarians uh, of today, certainly younger libertarians who might not have been libertarians or even born in 1979, uh, should should uh, become acquainted with because they thought he said some interesting things there. Um, hey, I do see Lucy, uh, so I think she'll be joining us soon. Uh, if you can hear us, Lucy, we have already started, so just come on in. I was just introducing things. I'm Sheldon Rickman, by the way. I think I should say that. Here she comes. Are you there? Sweet mother of mercy, that was awful. I apologize. That hey, we are live. multiple we are live. laptop disasters. Hello, everyone. Hi, Sheldon. Okay, you know we're live. I just wanted to let you know. <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> Makes you blurt it out. I wasn't going to say anything controversial. That's good. Or, or bad language. Or we're, we run a clean show here. So I was just going <laughs> to give a little, background, a little background to this article, which we're going to discuss, or this, at least the theme that was in the article. Uh, and so Brandon was giving a speech, gave a speech at the 1979 Libertarian Convention in Los Angeles. It was quite a... Uh, exciting uh, convention, I have to say. I, I was involved in the Libertarian Party back then. I haven't been in a while. but uh, So Brandon gave this talk where, where uh, again, the title was, you know, what, uh, I don't know where to go. Uh, what, how are the, how are Libertarians, what happens when, liber when the Libertarian movement begins to succeed? He was beginning to see signs of success in the sense of public discussion of Libertarianism, articles being published uh, by Libertarians in mainstream outlets. Uh, more and more discussion of it, uh, nothing like compared to today, of course, but uh, uh, but till that up to that time, it was quite remarkable. So he's, you know, he was a, he was a psychologist, and he knew libertarians over many years, both from the Ayn Rand movement and then the Nathaniel Brandon Institute, and then beyond. He had been to lots of libertarian gatherings and libertarian party gatherings. So he he had a good bit of experience talking to uh, libertarians and observing libertarians. And the reason he asked this question of whether why could libertarians handle success was the was the, the following. He thought that a I think he said a minority of libertarians. He didn't think this applied to all libertarians, but a minority of libertarians were libertarian in the movement, not only because they wanted to see a libertarian society come about, but maybe in some cases more because. They simply were drawn to a marginal movement. They wanted to be, people wanted to be in a fringe movement. He thought there was a, a 
a type of libertarian, and and, he, and I'm, I, I'm sure you'd say this was true of other movements too, other other sort of minority movements. There are people drawn to it, not so much that the, they want to see the ideas prevail, but they like being rebels, outsiders. They like being the uh, the martyr who's fated to fail. And so he wondered, well, what's that person going to, how's that person going to react? How's that type of libertarian going to react? If we actually see signs of success, and so he just speculated about what uh, such people would do. He, he, he wondered whether the factionalism that, the liber that was sort of beginning to tear apart the Libertarian Party uh, had something to do with that. Maybe some of these Libertarians who are sort of just rebels first and interested in liberty kind of second were, were uh, looking for factionalism and sectarian fighting because, uh, you know, if the whole movement begins to succeed, you got to now have your own sub-faction. To be the to, you know to be the uh, rebel uh, in, so uh, the article has a, has a long quote from Brandon, which I won't uh, I won't read here. You, you're all welcome to read the article if you haven't already uh, done it. Uh, but um, I think that maybe this is enough uh, to to get us to, uh, at least Lucy and uh, me discussing this, uh, and we can fill in the the you know the blanks and the big gaps I've left there uh, through the more the through the conversation. So how about that, Lucy? Did I say enough? Are you hearing me? Hello? Uh oh. Hello, Lucy. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh. Okay. I thought, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. So, should we just I, plunge um, in now? Did you're you're enough? breaking up enough that I think I, I missed a key part of what just happened. Okay. Did, um, did I... Could you repeat that? <laughs> yeah, I was wondering if I said enough to, to launch the, the conversation, or should I keep going? Well, um, it's it's always up to you. If you want to keep going and keep talking, I still, I'm still getting my bearings here, but um, I found this all interesting. I have things to say, and our, um, our viewers can uh, ask us things if, if, you, if you want. Um, <laughs> Well, I, I can say I can say a bit more. What, what I uh, I extrapolated a little bit from Brandon. I, I don't think he would have disagreed with where I took it. But the, the 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 question I think he was raising. I mean, he had this idea about the what he called the art of living consciously. He even did seminars on this. And the idea being, you should you know you should live your life quite consciously. You should be thinking about what you're doing, why you're doing it, what's your purpose. And so I think he in this in this speech he was applying it to to your activism, your libertarian activism. What is a libertarian, when a libertarian engages a non-libertarian in conversation, what's the purpose? And you can come up with a few different purposes and they could overlap and one, one person could have, uh, uh, hold uh, two or more of them. But the problem is that may, the, if, if the person does hold two or more of these, these motives or objectives, it could undercut what I hope would be the primary objective, which is convincing the person of the rightness of, uh, of individual liberty and a system, and, you know, a social system based on freedom and, and, and trade and voluntary cooperation, all the libertarian values. Uh, Brandon's hunch was that, to, that there were, there were libertarians who were, who were more in it to show that they're smarter than other people, display their knowledge, display their righteousness, uh, you know, they're, they're more righteous than now because I'm a libertarian and you're not, and uh, you'll probably never even understand this. So I'm going to give you one chance. And, uh, you know, if you don't get it, if you don't get it, you know, the heck with you. He saw that in, in, in what he, thought, you know, too many libertarians. Again, I think he believed it was a minority, but those were the people he was addressing, or at least addressing this phenomenon. So if, if your purpose in, de in arguing or speaking to a non-libertarian is more to feel good, you know, to make it the sort of self-gratification at how much you know or how heroic you are or how, uh, you know, righteous you are or just you are versus the other person, uh, you're probably not going to be a good communicator of libertarian ideas. On the other hand, if, you're, if your goal is to persuade the person, because you, that's, you believe that's how you're going to create a free society by persuading enough people, then you're going to, first of all, you're going to pay close attention to how you say things, how you treat the other person, and that's going to uh, further the goal of uh, of winning uh, people over to the, the, the you know the freedom philosophy. 
So that's the challenge he was throwing out in this talk, which I which I thought was interesting enough to bring to people, you know, a new generation of libertarians to their attention. Um, so, well, when it comes to co converting the heathens, obviously you uh, have done you have done your work. We have Dave Barry out in the world who you apparently possess the capacity to talk to a statist, shall we say, and um, get them to think about liberty. I'm like, I'm of not two minds, but like multiple minds about this idea, because I think sometimes it's a really false accusation that libertarians are just trying to be edgy and um, out there and uh, just try, and they're trying to rebel against their parents, uh, their parents being the state, which is another horrifying implication that certain people argue. I don't know, I, th I think I've seen the worst of this, like I think I'm just gonna straight up name drop people like Christopher Cantwell, who may sincerely be you know, an anarchist, but does not appear to be at all interested in convincing anyone to be an anarchist. Like the type who is purely about just I'll sit here being a pure anarchist and I'll never do anything about it and I'll never, no compromise even to get you to think about this, just me pure as, you know, pure as moonshine. Um, and that is useless, I think. But at the same time, there are a million opportunities to compromise and to become you know, your, 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 your principles eventually become meaningless because you've compromised so much. And there's a lot of space in the middle, and that's where most people I know tend to dwell. So this idea that libertarians want, I don't know, I don't know if I ever believed this idea that if libertarianism caught on truly, there would be these people who would be like, well, never mind then. I'll find something new to be. I don't know. <laughs> Well, I think it's safe to say, I mean, I think, you know, fringe movements have been studied before, and I, it's safe to say that there's some percentage uh, of that type of person who's drawn to it. I mean, it seems inevitable that there would be. It doesn't mean it's a dominant uh, thing. And and uh, and Brandon was suggesting that, like I said, a, a person who sincerely wants a free society and wants to help bring it about could still have some of this in him or her, and it might come out in arguing with with people. And so you're not you're not tuned into how they're hearing your words. I mean, you think you know what you're saying, and you think it ought to be understood, but it can get lost in the you know the transmission from from you to the other person because you're using words in a way that they're not using words. I mean, he uses an example of you know calling people statists and looters and you know some terms which may be Greek to your listener. Uh, we know we know what they mean in this con you know in this group we know what they mean and and you use the word statist right. before which is fine but if you you know if you're arguing with someone and you say well you're just a statist and I've heard libertarians do that or you're just a hypocrite because you believe in you know you say you're for freedom but you're not you know you're for the drug war uh, that's probably not going to win the person over you know Socrates and I like to go back to about what Socrates you, you know used to do walking through the uh, agora. Uh, he tried to show people they held they held contradictory views, right? They claimed they were for justice, and they but then they had this other view, and they would define justice, but then they had this other view that were conflicted. He didn't say, "So, ha, you're a hypocrite," and then walk away. He tried to show how they could work work out the conflict where the where the noble conviction, noble belief was favored, and the the ignoble belief was uh, jettisoned. He showed them how he could, you know, they could engage in that sort of equilibration. Uh, rather than denouncing them as state, you know, he wouldn't call them status, but, you know, some some uh, insulting word. Uh, but libertarians often do that. I mean, I've seen enough, I've seen enough libertarians in action uh, to know. And th there is some of this uh, more righteous than thou in, 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 you know, in, 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 in too many libertarians. And, and it's not good communication skills if that's what you're really trying to do. The question is, though, are they really trying to communicate? That's that's the, I think the issue, Brandon is uh, bringing. Well, I mean, to actually try to convince other people, it's this it's this whole other thing 
beyond just wanting to rant about the state or the, the latest police brutality or something, which is an urge that is a huge chunk of my personality and it's genetic and my family and I sit around someday is just ranting about the state today. But that's, I mean, I think there's, there's a great, you know, like Students for Liberty weekends are for that kind of thing, but even those have these debates within them. There's this, it's like, it, you need discipline and restraint to actually try and change someone's mind about even one subject, much less the entire apparatus. And that's, I mean, it's just, you have to try. <laughs> um, but there's also this idea, like this horrible excessive purity idea that any kind of compromise, even rhetorical, like, well, I can see that you're worried about, um, I don't know, welfare, you know, and I'm worried about the poor too. And what do you think about that? There's this sort of idea that that's, even that is selling out with your mouth. Um, I don't know. There's, it's just not a very helpful idea, I think, but I think it's common among the more radical within libertarianism. Well, I don't see wrong, I don't see anything wrong with saying I'm also concerned that there are you know marginal marginalized uh, segments of society. Uh, what will happen to them? I mean, first of all, that's what's wrong with that? If you if you if you can believe that and be a libertarian and suggest ways that a free society would uh, would uh, well that that sort of thing would be addressed by people in a free society, mutual aid societies. Char charity. I don't think I don't see how that's compromising or selling out. Uh, I mean, this t this could take us into a more general discussion of uh, of strategy. Uh, and uh, I think the movement. I mean, people in the movement need to. I think a lot of, need to think a lot about strategy. I don't think there's been that much done on it. I mean, we, we, it's sort of we think we sort of talk about it, but you don't really see that much serious discussion. At least I don't. Uh, I mean, there are there are people in the movement who who think the strategy is to is to uh, two parts part part there's two plans plan A and plan B plan A is you know push the button the famous Leonard Reed button right if there was a button that would uh, abolish all the you, if you're an anarchist you'd say the state if you're a minarchist you'd say you know the the, the welfare and the warfare aspects aspects of the state I'd push that button and p plan B is in case there's not a button then plan B is you tell people you would push the button, right? So plan plan A is push the button. Plan B is if the, if plan B was pos, plan A was possible, I'd pursue plan A. That's not a strategy. Okay? First of all, mm -hmm. there's not a button. So with, so all you you know what are you doing when you announce to the world I would push the button? Is that persuasive to anybody? No. Isn't that just sort of moral preening, right? You're saying I I push the button. Well, that doesn't convince anybody. They don't know what the heck you're talking about. What button? You know, they don't know what you mean. So it's not a strategy. It's just like a flag you're raising, and to hell with them if nobody understands what it means. Well, I don't. That doesn't sound like a, a viable way to win a free, a free society. Um, going off of again the the minority thing, yeah. I've often again there are two two things in my mind about this. One is that. I am always delighted when I meet or speak or communicate with like a Christian anarcho-capitalist, um, somebody whose social views are wildly different than mine. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see them and I trust them, you know, I mean, I suppose they could secretly be, be, be conspiring to seize power and institute uh, a Christian theocracy, but most of them at least, at least the ones that I know and the ones I like are not, they really just want all that good Christianity to be voluntary. And I love to see that because it, you know, prove, it demonstrates that we don't need to subject everyone else to our uh, treasured views. But by the same token, I have been disappointed by sort of the limits of, of, of radicalism, people who are only radical in their ideas about what the government should do or rather shouldn't do. Um, so the fact that I sort of, sometimes wish people would be like, well, like, we don't have to necessarily accept all those, you know, gender roles without thinking about it, do we guys? Nope, we used up all our radicalism on the state. Um, 
but I still, I don't know if that's, that part of me is part of the libertarianism, the minority viewpoint thing, or if it's just a general cussedness about everything in the world. I don't know. I mean, I think. But, you know, these are, this is this is not a science, right? This is an this is an art, and so there's there's not an algorithm that can give you some kind of a firm answer. You can put it, can't put it into a computer. Uh, there's different ways to talk to different people. Uh, I, I did an article a couple of years ago about the aesthetics of libertarianism. I think people who don't like libertarianism or the or the market on aesthetic grounds, they're not really philosophically minded people. You know, we've all met people like that. They just think there's something unattractive, unlovely about trade and competition and profit. And we need to learn how to talk to people like that, to just say, well, wait a second, let me uh, here, read the Economics in One Lesson and you're going to understand it. That's not, probably not going to work for that person. You need to approach them on, on the aesthetic level and talk about Trade is a, is a form of cooperation, peaceful cooperation. And the market lets you cooperate with strangers at a great distance. Think of that. How about, isn't that nice? Now we're not just cooperating with our next door neighbor, but you know people we'll never see, but we're still engaged in peaceful cooperation for mutual benefit. I think you can appeal on a, uh, not so much a philosophical or strict sort of logical uh, grounds, but more aesthetic to show, to show there's something lovely about that. Uh, so people are different, and you have to kind of know who you're talking to and be sensitive to that. If what you're trying to do is is persuade or win them over, win their sympathies. Again, if you're if you're more just trying to display your libertarianism for purposes of self gratification, then you're not going to care what what kind of person it, that, that person is, what what you appeal to him. Uh, there's a. a, a we should be watching the the, uh, the chat um, uh, panel here. I do see that Kevin Kevin Tyson uh, has uh, brought up the issue of factionalism, mentioning that it was a hallmark of the old left, the new left. Uh, given their success in remaking in remaking American society, can we judge factionalism bad in and of itself? Uh, just quickly on that, I don't think uh, Brandon actually doesn't condemn it to totally. He says I can understand. Uh, that you know a movement can begin to say adopt uh, uh, ideas uh, that that are, are contrary to the basic principles, and there's been there's nothing wrong with identifying that, and and if, and then a faction could come out of that. I I think he's talking more about factionalism for the sake of factionalism. You know, my article I linked to that wonderful scene in the life of Brian, Monty Python's The Life of Brian, where um, you know the, the couple of people who make up the uh, the, uh, the Get the, have the quote from it. The, who make up the uh, you know the people's uh, uh, Judean front? Oh, here it is. As I put it, I'm reminded of uh, the hilarious scene in Monty Python's The Life of Brian, in which members of the People's Front of Judea explain that the only things they hate more than the Romans are the Judeo pe Judean People's Front and the Judean Popular uh, People's Front, uh, and and. You know, the faction was one person. They said, "Yeah, where is the, where is the popular Judean front these days?" And, and they say, "There he is, right over there." And they, you know, so they they took that. And I'm sure that was drawn from socialist movements, not the libertarian movement, but uh, but we've some of, we've seen some of that in the in the libertarian movement. So it's more factionalism for factionalism's sake, not a not a factionalism that's based in in in, in a real uh, disagreement over, say, application of libertarian principles. So uh, what should we do? We, we can invite questions. Do people know how to type, type questions so that we get displayed? There's a way to display them, aren't there? Isn't there? There is. Um, we're a low on uh, audience, I'm afraid. Um, uh, I, see, uh, but I see five. Any, any of them can ask questions away. Ask dozens of questions. We have um, an, uh, another good while, enough for several more questions. So if... Yeah. Uh, Keep you talking. crazy five people out there have questions. Um, they can always be answered. Maybe that's five different factions and they're not speaking to each other. <laughs> I mean, I get so sick of factionalism and yet it's all, I mean, there's so many 
reasons to fight, and I do think the war thing is probably number one. Um, but as a younger libertarian, it took me a while to realize how much infighting appears to be based 90% on who was mean to Murray Rothbard four decades ago or vice versa. And that was kind of an eye opener. I was like, oh, I thought this was like a really solid sort of meaty disagreement. No, it's just bitchiness, um, as it were. Look, libertarians are people, people, they're people. So they have the same, you know, shortcomings and as 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 everybody else and uh and this is part of the thing that brandon was getting at uh, i mean i really recommend that people uh, listen to the the talk it's linked in the the article so you can find it uh he's saying you know libertarians are human beings and libertarians need to understand that uh ideas that today seem self-evident to them weren't didn't always seem self-evident so give your listener a break right the fact that they're not getting it in the first five minutes uh doesn't mean they're you know, irretrievably evil, or that they're looters, their, their status, their uh, whatever bad name you can think to call them. Uh, they're they're uh, altruists, whatever. Uh, you might have taken more time than that. I mean, I, I I wasn't born knowing this stuff. I had to read a lot before I felt I had some handle on it. Uh, and that's probably true of uh, everybody. So uh, we need to be a bit charitable to our... I took a few with... shortcuts, of course. What's that? And I took a few the, shortcuts being second generation and all, but uh, yeah, well, some, my some dad. Some like you have advantage that the rest of us haven't had. <laughs> You're privileged. Yeah. You're, I, have, I have privilege, and I'm very happy about it. <laughs> um, we seem to have a camera request. We could see if that actually works. Oh, Presumably this person has a real-life question. I'm going to say push the button, and we'll see what happens. Something's happening. God help us all. I see the name Christopher Hudson, but I don't see anybody yet. There he is. Hello, Christopher. Hey, how are you? Are you hearing us? Oh, there he is. I can hear you good. Good. I actually just logged on. Welcome. Um, So I just logged on and was trying to get the camera working, and I wasn't even sure of the topic, so I probably ruined everything. But I'll ask a question. Uh, Very, Uh, very informal here. Uh, The topic is... uh, an article I wrote about a Nathaniel Brandon speech from 1979 to the LP convention, where he wondered whether libertarians would handle, be able to handle success, because he thought that maybe some libertarians are sort of uh, in, in the movement because uh, out of a sense of martyrdom, heroic, tragic, you know, uh, martyrdom. And yet, if it looks like they may not be martyrs, then how will they respond to that? I think we might have, have we lost you, Christopher? There he is. He's back. So, okay. Well, it's, it's taken us into, this, into a discussion of uh, strategy, how to talk to non-libertarians, factionalism. Is it is it a constructive thing? Not constructive. Anyway. Okay. Well, like I guess say? I guess a question I have is uh, libertarianism, like some other positions, is sort of it has a tendency to attract people with other fringe positions. So. Um, With that being said, I think that sort of encapsulates the sort of like anti-collectivism, anti-work together mentality. So I guess how do we still as a fringe position that libertarianism is, how do we attract people that also are open to collectively organizing and uh, handling success or not just being anti-everything, I guess, is my question. Yeah, that's, that's a fair question, and, and that that kind of gets at what I think part of what Brandon was saying that it, it can attract. He didn't think this was the majority of libertarians. He thought most libertarians were sincere. They really wanted to win people over and create a free society. But he thought there, you know, like in any movement, there's going to be uh, some percentage that uh, maybe displays or you know has the characteristics you're talking about. They're just attracted to being a min- into a minority uh, movement. And it may be the big fish in the small pond uh, uh, kind of attitude also. Uh, it seems to be libertarians have been able to attract 
uh, people who are not, not, uh, none of that kind, who, who simply want freedom and, and, and understand that it doesn't have to come with a whole baggage of, or a whole you know, big uh, list of other things. I mean, you can be a libertarian without believing 9-11 was an inside job. Right, I mean, you, you can you can go through a whole list. We all know. We all, I t you know, I tend not to be interested in those uh, conspiracies. I know I get criticized criticized about this, but uh, they don't have sort of the, to me the, they don't pass the sniff test. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they're all true, and I'm and I'm just uh, you know haven't put in enough time to figure it out. But but um, you know, you look for certain characteristics and other other things, and it doesn't follow that if you're that if you're a libertarian. Then all those things must be true. There's just no connection. I think that's illogical. I think uh, if, if the state is is bad, then uh, you know every conspiracy theory you can think of involving the state must uh, make, must actually be, you know be valid. I don't know that, how we can uh, go out of our way to attract people who don't fall into that. I I think we do attract people who who aren't of not not of that kind who simply want a free society, uh, but uh, I think it raised, you raise an interesting point. I'd like to hear from other people. Anybody? Um, Kevin has another question, which is very old guard out of my depth ish. So, is there a way we can? If, if there's anything there, I thought it says, let's see. I thought there was a way to display these questions. Uh, anyway, I can read it. Let's see if I can copy it into this window here. Let's see what happens when I hit submit. Uh, anyway, maybe not. Anyway, he, uh, um, the question from Kevin is: Does anyone know what sort of success the advocates for self-government have enjoyed since the passing of Marshall Fritz? Uh, oh, yeah, there it is. Look at that. I see it at the top of my screen. Yeah. Uh, I ask yeah, but it's there. <laughs> as their outreach um, was some of the most inclusive I've Pardon my heinous connection here. You keep freezing to me, Sheldon, so this is all very exhausting to try to figure out what's happening. Oh. Are you up to speed, uh, Lucy? Yes. Are you okay. So I don't know the answer to that. I, I, I don't hear much from the advocates for self government. Uh and so while I know it still exists, and, I, and uh, I, I'm pretty sure they have an active website, I don't follow it, so I don't know the answer. Marshall, of course, was really one in a million. Uh, he died a few years ago. He, he moved on from the Advocates for Self-Government at some point and found, founded the uh, Separation of Schools and State Alliance, which I uh, worked with him a bit on. I appeared at some of their conferences. And, he was quite an amazing person. He was a human dynamo, for one thing. I mean, the guy had so much energy. Did you ever come across him, Lucy? No. Um, I, I, I get the sense that's before my time, or before I, I was paying attention to well, he was, political, you know, he was a, uh, philosophical history, anything beyond yeah, World War II, yeah, probably. He got along with people very well. He loved people. He liked to talk to people. Uh, I can't imagine him engaging in tactics which would uh, turn off non-libertarians. He just had a way of looking for common ground, and and, and I think he personally was very successful uh, with that. Uh, and and uh, you know, I see Kevin has this uh, impression when he's, he's, uh, he's saying their outreach was some of the most inclusive I've ever experienced, and that's because that was that was Marshall, and I assume Marshall did influence the people who uh, he worked with at the. Uh, advocates and who carried it on afterwards. Uh, so that's the most I can say about Marshall and the advocates. Uh, I don't know how the organization is doing. Anybody else? Do um, you want to say anything? Yeah, any other questions are good. We have a, a few more minutes, say 10 more maybe. Um, in general, I mean, this always comes back to the same damn question. To me, which is, and you're you're a good person to ask because you have the proper loathing for politics, but you're also not not compromising on the important stuff, uh, Sheldon. Mm -hmm. I mean, th there are people who make the kind of the critiques about the insular, don't want to convert the heathen type anarchist libertarians, 
and then then they say ergo Rand Paul 2016 or um, I mean ha, ha, how does one respond to that you know like that's why we got to dive into politics um, because I suppose it's theoretically possible that if someone slightly more amenable to liberty were president something the country would be slightly more amenable to liberty even if it was you know very small so what's the answer to the electoral politics junkie wing of the libertarians um if you have any yeah you're not you know there are people that like that activity uh you know the, when the libertarian party started one of the arguments for it i mean people a lot of people say why would the libertarians have a party political party well of course a lot of libertarians weren't anarchists so I mean, that's one answer uh, so they, they still may feel that they want to elect, try to elect candidates who will move things in a libertarian direction but uh but he, you know but even among anarchists uh, it, uh being an anarchist doesn't rule out any particular um tactic or strategy uh I mean, if you're a libertarian anarchist it would rule out violence but as far but i can see oh, i don't know why an anarchist can't you know assuming there was a candidate who you know you, you could say really was better than the alternative uh it doesn't violate anarchism to, uh, in my view I, I get arguments about this i know uh to try to go out and get that person elected it doesn't mean the, the one vote's going to count because we know that one vote doesn't count but you might still try to go out and get a lot of people uh to vote for that person so there are people that like oh so i was saying that the one argument for the libertarian party that people made the founders made in those days was it's around election time that people are thinking about politics and it's the only time of year maybe that they're thinking of political theory at all you know it may not be real high abstract theory but it's they're thinking about politics at that time of year and maybe that's the only time they are or every four years or every two years the, the election and so that's the time that libertarians ought to be out there talking to them and that and that was one argument that was made i think that ended up being persuasive with murray rothbard at first he didn't seem to want to have anything to do with the party. And then uh, he then became active in the party for, 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 quite, for quite a while, uh, into the 80s, certainly, into the, uh, I'm not sure when he finally left it, sometime after 1983, I guess. <clears throat> um, and so that's not a bad argument. The question is, who do you latch on to? And uh, in some, you know, it's, it's theoretically possible that there could be someone who's who you can be, you know, kind of enthusiastic about. I mean, uh, Ron Paul. Uh, I mean, you can you can point out drawbacks to Ron Paul uh, because of his own personal history and his own combination of, uh, of policies. But you know, certainly what he made the most his most prominent issues are, were certainly worth talking about, and uh, it, I'm sure it cheered libertarians to hear someone talking about a non-interventionist foreign policy and, and why there need not be central banking, there shouldn't be central banking and government-controlled currency. And, uh, you know, the, the other things that he talked about, he, he even sounded uh, anti-drug war a lot of the time. He wasn't perfect on that. He wasn't good on immigration. But even even his position on immigration was, you know, he, he didn't believe in free immigration, but he opposed every everything that the anti-integrationists proposed. But he was against the wall. He was against... Uh, punishing businesses. I, I thought he was a closet open borders guy, right? I'm, a, I'm for closed borders, but I don't want the government to do anything about, you know, <laughs> immigrants coming in or people who hire them. That, you know, maybe he was just being, you know, covert mm -hmm. about that. I, I, I don't seriously think that, but it, I thought it was interesting that he opposed everything, which was great. Uh, so I can, I can understand wanting to have someone you could be excited about. Uh, the, the problem, the big problem comes uh, when you really begin to stretch because you want to have somebody, you're desperate to have somebody, and you begin to lower your standard. Uh, this seems to be a case of it this, this year or next, this year and, and going into next year because I don't see where Rand Paul has anything uh, that makes me think of his father. And, and so I don't, you know, even Justin, uh, Ramondo has now denounced him. <laughs> Uh, wash the hands of, of him. So uh, I I don't see how libertarians can be getting excited about Rand Paul. I mean, foreign policy, he's you know he's been re really really pretty bad. He, he said one or two things which suggested he might be good, and then he ended quickly muddy, muddied it up. And now it's it's uh, now he signs Tom Cotton's letter, and he's talking up the Iranian threat. And 
So I, I don't know why libertarians would be attracted to the to Rand Paul. Uh, anything else here? I see another. I see a question here. Uh, is, this is from Christopher. Is there a value in some forms of compromise for strategic reasons, uh, attracting participants? Well, I don't. I don't see how you're going to win people over strate for strategic reasons, or how it can be a good strategic reason to al allow for exceptions to the principle. If that's what you mean by compromise. Uh, so I, I guess I'd have to say no, but I, I would draw a distinction between compromising the principles and saying something positive, however, you know, half-hearted, about a transition move move in the direction of, of liberty. I mean, I know there are people that who believe you should never say anything positive about, you know, like a halfway move, even if you really believe it is a halfway move. Uh, and I don't understand that. Uh, I mean, let's imagine, you know, I'm against Social Security, right? Even though pretty soon I'll be eligible for Social Security. <laughs> so uh, imagine that they, that the Cato reform, the, the reform that Cato has pushed for many years, Jose Pinera, Peter Ferrara kind of reform, uh, was a live option. And one of the things that reform did was 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 uh, was changed the nature of the contribution. It's forced, of course, and, and it would still be forced. So that's not good. But it changed the nature of that from tax revenues that the government takes the money from you through the tax system, and then you know pays it out to uh, retirees, and then there, if there's any surplus, it just spends it on stuff. So let's say it changed from that to you now have a property right in that money. In other words, we're not going to take it from you. We're simply going to force you to put it into a private retirement account. Now, the force is bad, agreed. So I'm not saying libertarians should say, oh, that's a great program, we're all for it, that's all we need to do. But why would we say the one aspect of declaring that, you, that that's your property, which you can then pass to your heirs, is a real move in the libertarian direction? Now let's get rid of the rest of the unlibertarian stuff about it. The fact that you're forced to put a certain percentage in, that the kind of investments are controlled by the government, they have to license uh, uh, investment uh, houses. We can go after all that stuff and still say the property right is a good thing because that's what we want. People have property rights in their money and being be able to pass it, like I say, pass it to heirs and things. So I don't regard that as a compromise, but I know people who would regard that as a compromise. I don't think it's a compromise because I'm not saying that's what we should settle for. But if somebody proposed that and it, that bill has a chance of getting through, I don't see what's wrong with saying, hey, that would be a good thing. Maybe not even publicly, but I don't know why I couldn't say to myself, hey, I'd have a property right in that money. Yeah, that's an improvement. Why can't I say that? Anyway, that's that's my take on that. Anybody else want to join in? I didn't uh, make anybody mad by that. Ah, okay, Christopher agrees with me. <laughs> Thank you, Christopher. I think there can be improvements. There can be incremental improvements. Now, some, in my view, some things that are proposed as incremental improvements may not really be. Like, I don't think vouchers is a move, and Milton Friedman disagrees with this, but would have disagreed with this, that vouchers, and, and Marshall Fritz disagreed with this, uh, that, uh, no, the, Fritz would agree with me, I'm sorry, that vouchers would be a move toward getting rid of the government schools. It seems to me that would help entrench the go uh, government schools or government control over private schools. So there, I think the problem is it's not a true incremental move. But that doesn't mean anything that's offered as an incremental move can't be a genuine incremental move. I mean, that would be an illogical argument. If A, if a is not a real incremental move, it doesn't mean B isn't. We have to judge B on its own merits, not, well, A wasn't, so therefore B must not be. Uh, there can be par partial moves. So I hope I've made myself clear. Are you getting all this, Lucy? Close, <laughs> Just enough that I get the idea, not enough that I can contribute anything useful. This has been a very frustrating podcast, but it, it's all my fault. So I apologize yeah. to the whole wide world, especially you. Wants to get in a last, uh, a last question or comment. 
Um, I think, I guess it's kind of wrap up time. If you, um, okay. Sheldon, do you want to tell the good people where they should look up your works, what they should do, et cetera? Uh, yes. uh, well, all my stuff is posted here at liberty.me. I guess I shouldn't say here because this is precast, but liberty.me. So you can check in there. But also my blog, that's where things uh, begin now, uh, which is a free association. And the quickest way to get there is just sheldonrichmond.com. Uh, Reason is also posting my things, uh, the two articles a, uh, a week. So you can find them there if you happen to be there and want to see what the latest is. So please check those out and watch for more notices about these. Uh, we're doing two of these a month. So uh, I hope you'll come back. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Sheldon. Um, people can go follow me on Twitter, and that's the easiest, L-U-C-Y-S-T-A-G, if that's your uh, thing. I just wrote a thing for Vice about surveillance that's very depressing. You can go read that somewhere if you want. Um, and also, I'm supposed to tell you fine people, speaking of uh, selling out, we're going to have uh, Austin Peterson talking <laughs> about Rand Paul with um, our beloved overlord at liberty.me, Jeff Tucker. Um, and I might go in there right now and troll Austin Peterson. I'll think about it at least. Um, so thanks for watching, everybody. Thanks for your questions. Thanks, Sheldon. Sorry about my disaster. Next time, if there's okay. next time, I'll try to. It was okay. It was okay. It worked out. Anyway, Thank you, everybody. I'll see you guys next time. Bye. Good night. Bye.